Hello everyone, I'm Brian. Today I'm reacting to Enlightenment. Is it spontaneous, transformative, and confer extraordinary powers? Is it spontaneous? I would assume kind of so in that one, as as in the fact that you just don't know when it's going to hit you, I suppose. It's going to take time and eventually you'll get there. Is it transformative? I, I would think so, because now you are in, enlightened. Now, does it confer extraordinary, extraordinary powers? I guess if you consider being blissed out all the time powers, then yes. But not like, you know, like superhero powers or anything like that. Let's go get started. This question is from Mohammed Ibrahim PK. Is enlightenment a spontaneous process, just like awakening from sleep to the existing world? What is the difference between a normal person and an enlightened person when experiencing the world? Can an enlightened person see the past, present, and the future? All right, three different questions, actually. First, an interesting question. Do, is enlightenment and uh, uh, is it a spontaneous process like waking up from sleep? Mm, answer is yes and no. <laughs> and no, because you have to put in a lot of effort yeah. to become enlightened in general. It yeah, could yeah. happen spontaneously, but generally you have to put in a lot of effort. So in Vedanta, you have to purify the mind. Uh, you have to concentrate and focus the mind. And then you have to undergo Vedantic training, which consists of studying, listening to these Vedantic teachings, then thinking about them, and then um, uh, meditating upon that. You know, basically <coughs> attending Ask Swami sessions, lots of them. <laughs> <laughs> so that is uh, sadhana. You have to develop devotion, we have to uh, maybe get a mantra and repeat it um, millions of times and meditate and uh, try, try to become more selfless and all on the basis of an ongoing continuing moral struggle to be truthful, to be self-controlled, to be selfless, to be loving. So all a lot of hard work. So it's not spontaneous that way. However, it's not entirely wrong to say it's spontaneous because at the final level, when one one does become enlightened, you know, in whichever way you you see, if you are a devotee, you have the vision of your chosen deity. If um, you are a you know meditator, you have samadhi, or in in the Vedantic sense, you have that breakthrough. You realize, I am Brahman. All of these, they all agree on one point. That last breakthrough was not our effort. Last breakthrough was not our effort. We did whatever we could do at our level, but the last breakthrough, that enlightenment, some would, some would call it grace, some would call it spontaneous. It comes from somewhere else. Probably it's already coming, we are not able to catch it. And we put in the hard work, then we are able to catch it. Swami Vivekananda put it this way. All we can do is polish the mirror. All we can do is polish the mirror. He didn't ex explain any further. All we can do is polish the mirror. Mirror is the mind, where the enlightenment will occur. And what we can do is, we can purify the mind, through ethical and selfless life, we can focus the mind through meditation and we can tune the mind through Vedantic studies to begin to notice what is being said. But like a mirror, when you polish it, it catches the reflection very well. It catches the um, object very well in a clear reflection. That reflection, it comes from the object. The mirror by itself cannot develop a reflection, no matter how much you polish it. You have to have the object which will be reflected in the mirror. Similarly, it's a very good uh, analogy for enlightenment. We can polish the mirror, but the actual catching of the reality, it depends on the reality itself. In Advaita Vedanta, the reality is us. We ourselves are that reality. So spontaneous or not. Then the second question was, what is the difference? How does the enlightened person, ordinary person see the world? person and an enlightened person when experiencing the world. I'll just change the terminology. Uh, otherwise it will become a normal person and abnormal person and <laughs> enlightened person. Uh, in, we prefer, a, a prefer unenlightened person and enlightened person. Or a seeker and the one who has found it. 
um, the difference is first of it's like this um, swami vivekananda was walking in the deserts of rajputana you know rajasthan now and uh, he used to see in a distance a beautiful oasis you know where this is going so we, one day he became thirsty and when he went close to it he saw that it was a mirage there was no water there and then he started walking again but the interesting thing happened next when he looked back what did he see the oasis water beautiful water lot so much water there but now he knows that he knows that it is uh, there's no really there's really no water there it just looks like that similarly enlightenment after enlightenment you see the same world you see the same world however is a vast difference if you have eyes as long as you have eyes you will see forms colors shapes you have ears you will hear sound and so on but your understanding of what you are seeing has changed so dramatically now if i say understanding people will think oh so so you have understood some theory no 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 it is so dramatic and so direct and so powerful that you it it's very uh, honest to say that you are actually seeing in an entirely different way i remember this one monk who i consider to be enlightened so i was a novice i approached him um this is what nearly 30 years ago um this was his name was swami mokshadanand ji he has passed now i remember still remember clearly in his room i was this absolute new you know novice to we are talking about this question what is what happens you know what do you see where is that reality you're talking about brahman everywhere so where is it something like that was the question but this little bit i remember very clearly he looked at me so is this uh, short fair man with hair like einstein you know like frizzy hair and bright eyes shining like stars he was suffering a lot physically he was on uh, i had to take oxygen about 10 12 hours a day but always and and never ever till the end of his life saw him without a smile and twinkling eyes anyway so this was long before the, the end of his life um i knew him for about 7 8 years so this was one of the first meeting second or third meeting i think so i asked him this question and he looked at me and he said this is it he's pointing to the, the window of his room and there was a tree outside and sunlight and the ganges the ganga flowing by this is it i said this a window the tree so this is brahma mm-hmm. and then he said rather pensively he said not quite and then in bengali he said acha thak pare hobe let it be it will happen in its own time it will happen <laughs> what i was seeing as a window as a tree as sunlight and water he was seeing quote on quote as brahman was he not seeing the window he was after all it's like this you look at the altar so yes and look at the wood here you'll say yeah are you seeing two different things no you're seeing the same thing but it is true and true wood only this altar every bit of it touch wood so you see so like that so the enlightened one sees brahman sees again quote and quote you'll see exactly what i see what we we all see but more than that much deeper uh, the mirage example i remember professor uh, j garfield who's an expert on indo tibetan on buddhism madhyamaka buddhism uh, he he has a nice take on this mirage example it's because something that's used both in vedanta and in buddhism so he says he says that you see this mirage when you're driving along in a long road in, in through a desert like in arizona for example uh, i also have seen this so i i related to that example now he says there are different takes on this one is when you see the, the mirage the the novice driver who's driving through for the first time or who doesn't know what is uh, what is going to see what will he think it is he'll think it's water like vivekananda thought it was water then um the expert driver who has driven through this many many times he see, he has done this many times before and uh, when he sees that same thing what will he see it's a mirage he knows it as a mirage 
and the person who has understood what a mirage is who has read that book who has thought it through like us in between person what will that person see that person will see water but will understand oh this is what is called a mirage so there is the ordinary man of the world who sees this and takes this to be the real that's there's nothing more to it this is the reality there's the enlightened one jivan mukta who sees this and says this is brahman appearing as samsara it's it's the, the same reality it's existence consciousness place i guess the question would be asked here is then what is brahman and you say existence consciousness bliss well i mean existence if you would explain that i guess the re- the things we see i suppose that's ex- existence things that exist is existence consciousness <clears throat> how would you explain that well consciousness i mean <laughs> um i guess if you were to ask me what is consciousness I, i'd have a little bit of a difficult time explaining that because <clears throat> because well the hard question of consciousness like swami sarvaprana swami sarvaprana here would say but like how would you describe that it's like is it something that the, is it electric electric signals in the brain is that consciousness i think uh they would say no so it's something consciousness itself is something that cannot be explained scientist doesn't have an answer to it and um i believe in the terms of advaita vedanta that it's not something physical <laughs> i think it's it's non-material which then again becomes very difficult to explain now bliss man we went over that yesterday bliss is not happiness it's not pleasure it's it's someone in the comments said not contentment but again if you you disagree with that that's fine but it kind of explain what he mean by, okay if it's not contentment then what is it <laughs> you know don't just say it's not contentment man you're leaving me hanging here i think it's contentment meaning that there's no desires there there's no need there's no wants yeah, that's what i believe contentment to be but if you if you disagree with that then do explain what do you what what, what is it then you know i don't think it's pleasure uh but perhaps contentment is a closer or at least for me the closest word to it because contentment means you have no desires no wants no needs because you're content but obviously contentment tends to be at least in terms of the words we use it contentment just is a temporary thing but more along the lines of contentment in terms of the infinite i suppose i don't know if that's the right word to say but essentially that you are forever content that you'll never ever desire anything you'll never want anything you'll never need anything now don't get me wrong the body still needs and wants and desires stuff but generally speaking contentment is this <clears throat> um in terms of at least being bliss is uh an infinite thing i hope that makes sense so I went on a tangent there. <laughs> but the consciousness is kind of hard to explain. Um obviously we are this is there's a word we say that we are conscious. It's a word that's created that says that we exist and are alive. But that's all that consciousness I believe means. It's not necessarily something material or it's not like there's consciousness, you know, I'm holding it in my hand. <laughs> You know, it's it's not it's it's a kind of like uh it's kind of like a description of something that does not have a physical uh physical thing happiness it's actually physical there's chemicals that go off in your body and as a matter of fact someone can inject your body excite those little things and you'll be happy whether you want it to be or not um uh, sadness is the same thing it's very much chemical reactions in our body hope that is an idea 
what is hope? There's not a chemical thing called hope. <clears throat> so consciousness is kind of like it. It might be more chemical, but it could be. Well, put it this way: if it is chemical, scientists haven't discovered it yet. I know a lot of people are going to say no. Consciousness is not chemical. It's like hope, where it's it's it's, it's it doesn't have a a physical uh, existence in the in the in the realm. It exists, but it's not physical. Because hope is an idea that doesn't have a physical representation, not even chemically, I don't believe. I don't know if you can feel hope. I mean, you can kind of, but it's more not than it is, I think. Anyways, I hope you get my idea. <laughs> and there is us in between, unfortunately. <laughs> we experience just as any unenlightened person would say, but we have read a lot of Vedanta. So we will look at the world and say, Oh, I see, it's a world, but actually it is, this is what is supposed to be Brahman, with names and forms, it is the world. <laughs> what are we seeing the world? We are trying to, we are, our understanding is that it is Brahman. So three levels. And then he adds a fourth level, there is some kind of, he said, polarized glasses. If you wear those glasses while driving, you will not see the mirage also. You will not see anything. You will not see the water, you won't see the mirage. And so he says, the person in Samadhi, is awake, is fully um, uh, alert, but not seeing the world appearance is absorbed in the reality itself, only in samadhi state, when the mind is tuned to that. That's like wearing polarized glasses. So four options. Uh, one is the ordinary person who sees the mirage as water. Uh, this water, I'm seeing water, and is fooled by it. Uh, like Vivekananda may rush toward to drink it. This, uh, and like the rest of us, we see the world and this is real and we rush towards it to drink it. That means, this is the world that will satisfy me. Here I will find a lot of money which will make me rich and happy. I will find the best relationships where people will be endlessly nice to me. I will be the most popular person all in fa on Facebook and so on and so forth. Uh, and always find parking. So, <laughs> all of that. This is the world which will supply me with all these things which I want. This is the fool rushing towards the water. There's no water there. And we keep getting hard knocks from life. The enlightened one, who is Vivekananda, when he is walking away from the mirage and looks back and sees the same water, he says, it's a mirage. It's, he will no longer rush towards to, to drink it. So the enlightened one sees Brahman. And the world appearance is an appearance. And then there's the Samani in Samadhi. And the, then the one, the Vedantic practitioner, the philosopher, the book, the read a lot of books and heard many YouTube talks. You will still see the world and react to it as the world, but keep on thinking, no, Brahman. <laughs> <laughs> what the third part was, can this person see, oh, all right. Real quick. So I said there's four parts. There's the, we'll go in order. So the ordinary person, the seeker, the one who understands that the world is supposed to be Brahman but doesn't quite see it that way. Then you have the person who is Swami Vivekananda who's walked past and understand that the world is Brahman. And then you have Samadhi. So those last two, um, the enlightened person I believe and then the Samadhi, I, what are the difference between those two I don't quite understand. I thought he was going to say three parts which I get. Not enlightened, on the way seeking enlightenment, um, enlightened person. But then there's Samadhi. I don't understand the, the two parts, the last two parts. Someone who realizes the world is an illusion and who is enlightened and then someone who's Samadhi. If you can explain that part to me, I don't quite understand that. I understand the three of obviously those who just live everyday lives who don't realize, who don't seek enlightenment. Those who understand and need to, or wants to seek enlightenment, and those who have achieved enlightenment. I believe those are the three parts. I assume the one who walked past the mirage and looks back and says, it looks like water, but I know it's not. And then the samadhi person. Where does, I don't understand the, those last, I kind of understand the enlightened person part, I think. But samadhi. Or am I confusing, you know, I, I hope you understand the question, because... I, I just, I, I say, like, why is there two separate ones? I assume once you're enlightened, that's the highest form, or samadhi the highest form. Or are those two the same? 
just one is enlightened and the other one's only enlightened doing something, med meditating or something? Past, present and future. This is a general question of do enlightened persons have special powers? You know, are they like Superman and Spider-Man mm -hmm. or something like that? No, really. This was an uh, ancient question, a big question in India and in other places of the world also because these enlightened beings are powerful beings. They're extraordinary beings. From a Vedantic perspective, do enlightened persons possess extraordinary powers? The straight answer is no. However, uh, enlightenment doesn't make you, uh, you know, in the world, as far as you are concerned, you still remain the same person. With the, ex the difference is that you see the truth. Others are walking around in a daze. That the name Buddha comes from that, the one who has awakened. That means the rest of us, we are sleepwalking. So you have awakened to the truth. But can you do extraordinary things in this world? You can, your behavior will be extraordinary, no doubt. Mm. You, will be, you will be a saint. You will be a, a most remarkable person. Most remarkable person, that's no doubt. However, special powers like seeing past, present and future, or you know, are you able to levitate, or see the thoughts of other people. Enlightenment by itself does not confer you with those powers. However, the situation is complicated because there are ways of acquiring these powers and I cannot deny that certain, some of these powers exist. I have seen it too many times. And I don't want to call them supernatural powers. I think they are natural powers. We just don't know them uh, as natural powers. We have so many powers. Uh, even, this, you know, what's the most remarkable achievement in all of our lives? We, we have forgotten it completely. Tremendous achievement. Learning to walk on two legs. <laughs> A remarkable achievement. Learning to read and write and speak in a language. And so many amazing, miraculous things we have learned since we were babies. And there were some other, probably some other powers which we don't know about in general, so we consider them supernatural and when they are manifested we think they are extraordinary. But they are available. And they may, so there are ways, especially in yoga and tantra, to acquire these powers. And uh, there are many who are not enlightened who have got these powers and many who are enlightened who have got these powers. And that's why sometimes, because to become enlightened, as I said, we have to put in a lot of groundwork, a lot of hard work. Part of that hard work is meditation and also intense prayer. So this connection to God through prayer and meditation does awaken some of these latent powers, um, including, for example, seeing past, present and future uh, to some extent. All the time knowing past, present and future, only God knows that, you know, omniscient. Mm -hmm. But some yogis, definitely they do. They, we cannot deny it, they, they do. I and mean, there's so many examples that you cannot... Uh, so Generally, you would expect advanced spiritual practitioners to have some of those powers. And also remember, all great masters counseled against using these powers. If worldly, the usual worldly temptations can suck us back into worldly life and mm, prevent further progress in spiritual life, then these uh, extraordinary powers can be even greater temptations and they can ruin, utterly ruin a person's spiritual life. There's a story of uh, the um, Buddhist monk, you know, they used to go out for begging for food. So one day they came back to the Buddha and they were all excited and said, one of our brothers developed an extraordinary power um, and show, show him show him and that monk came forward quite proudly and he tossed his begging bowl up in the sky and it floated in the sky so when it came down the Buddha said bring it to me and he bought it and the Buddha took the begging bowl and smashed it and smashed it means that was a way of throwing somebody out of the monastic order and told him to leave the monastic order so such powers are there but uh, Everybody, especially Thakur, Swamiji and others, they all have cautioned against using these powers or chasing these powers. All right. <clears throat> so there's many. I'm kind of curious as to, I guess, the proof of it. Um, again, I, I don't ever just believe in anything now. Do I believe that we, ha we can have certain kind of powers? Yes, what's well, kind of physically capable of our bodies. <clears throat> we don't have any way of flying, so do I believe in levitation? No. Um, can we 
can we become stronger than what we normally are? Absolutely, because I do believe in in terms of science, we only we're only consciously able to unlock about eighty percent of our power, um, and then to get that extra twenty percent would be very damaging to the body. But it's there, and it's possible under dire circumstances, your body will will well, I don't say break everything, but perhaps sacrifice a limb to save the body <laughs> so um, I think uh, I've heard scientists have proven this to where if for example you get in a car accident and you get out the car your car's flipped over and all of a sudden your your person that you love is out there screaming help me I can't get out of the car I'm stuck you will generally speaking you that that cry of help will unlock a certain level of strength that you never had before. There's been stories said about this, where people who are able to lift up things that were not capable of lifting, even after the fact, they're like, you lifted this you lifted this thing, it's like impossible, can you lift it again? And it did it outside of a strenuous or a crucial moment, and they couldn't. And again, that's very po uh, possible, I believe, to unlock, to go beyond your limit. Uh, again, um, the Swami, Swami Vivekananda, he has an ability to very much remember things very well. I forgot he, he was very good at that. And that's, again, very, very easy when there's been examples of people doing that too. They can train themselves to do that. And there are some people who are just kind of naturally like that. I believe... Now, this is kind of difficult, um, this, this other part about memory. I think there's some people who just remember everything that happens in their life. Every single thing they can remember to a great detail. To the point of the exact time, what's around them, what they what they witness around them. And ten years back, they can remember it perfectly. Now, that's very difficult for me to believe. Because that's kind of, that's crazy. I've never seen, and uh, <laughs> I've not seen anyone do it. Now, I can, I can believe people can remember what they observed in the room. But the retention of that information for a prolonged period of time is just crazy. Is it possible? I mean, maybe. <laughs> I mean, the only way to really test that is to have someone go in a room, put a whole bunch of different crap around, and then to come, make them uh, come back ten years later. And you go, you go, it's like, okay, this is here, this is here, this is here. It's like, then you ask them a question, you're like, okay, so what was in this corner? Okay, in that corner? Okay, what time was it when you went in that room? You know, if you, you, and if they call that, it's like holy smokes. If if they get it right, then wow. <laughs> um, we I, I think we are limited to what the body is capable of doing, uh, but we can push the boundaries of what's limit, uh, what's the body's limitation. Uh, that limitation will vary based on the person. Obviously, someone who works out can you know twenty percent of the power could be eighty percent of my power because they work out all the time and I don't. So them 20%, me 80% is equivalent. I could go to say 90% if I can unlock it and then overpower their 20%. And and then for example, you know, if they go to 80%, they can obviously lift more than me, but then push to that 90% power, which can lift even more than what they're normally capable of. But when you go 100%, you risk damaging a lot of the stuff, whatever whatever it is you're using, you're pushing beyond its boundaries. Um, kind of like, uh, I guess you could look at weightlifters when they, oh my gosh, it's so scary. They have the, the, the muscle here. I can't remember which workout it was. I think it's the bench press. And then you see the muscle here. Oh, yeah, you see the muscle here. Uh, I don't think I can, not really. <laughs> Anyways, you see the muscle here. It's like really flex and then just kind of curls up over here because it rips off the bone oh <laughs> but um yeah you see that it's like oh my gosh it's like i don't want to work out anymore <laughs> but you know obviously they, they're pushing their bodies beyond the limitation and that's what happens <laughs> or the calf muscles too you yeah, have seen some of those in, in youtube of course not in real life but yeah that's that's pretty easy to believe that your body will break yes <laughs> easy to believe um, but yeah anyways um, let me know about the the uh, the two the last two the I believe the enlightened person and then the Samadhi person
What are the difference? <clears throat> That's the thing I just didn't quite understand. Why is there a fourth? I was thinking three, not enlightened, seeker, enlightened. And then the Samadhi. Uh, anyways, let it leave it in the comments below. Help me understand that part. So that's my reaction to Enlighten. Is it spontaneous, transformative, or for extraordinary powers? If you like the content, please consider subscribing. Thumbs up, thumbs down down below. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next vid.